Are you okay? How did the week of prayer and fasting go? I can't tell you how much I smelt bread cooking in the neighborhood. I uh, struggled, eh? Mm. And every time I went to a shop, I just saw Cadbury's lunch bars. Anyway, you know what it's about? It's about making space for God. That's what this is about. I believe we should feast a week. Feast and pray, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to feast and pray. But I'm glad you did that. Thank you. Let's trust God to do some amazing things. Last Friday, this Friday, uh, 35 to 40 young kids got piled into cars and they went into the inner city, handed out blankets and food uh, for the street to street people, men and, and women, and uh, it was amazing to see. We don't realize, there are 3,000 people live in the streets in Durban. And, uh, and they have a different life, a different community. And we have an opportunity, wherever we are, to be able to just keep them warm. Give them some food. Don't worry about what they do with the blanket. Oh, but you're going to give them a blanket, they're going to sell it for drugs. Who cares? Give them a blanket. Is that all right? Let's keep people warm. And let's give them a sandwich. Even if they throw it in the paper, don't worry. Don't worry about that. The thing is, we want people to feel the warmth of God's love. That's the main thing. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. But I'm just going to pick up a verse uh, in James tr about true religion. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. This man or this woman's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. God doesn't overlook the overlooked. That's the bottom line. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about that. I can't believe that we have a God who just loves everybody. If you and I want to get the heart of true religion, then we need to do the Word. If you want to get the heart of true religion, you need to do the word. Visit the orphans and widows in distress. Care for the poor. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked, etc., etc. Look after the destitute. You see, our relationship with God is not what we know. It's what we do with what we know. And how we live that out by faith. True religion, true religion doesn't overlook the overlooked. And let's be honest. Poor people, destitute people, orphans, widow, people sleeping on train tracks, people sleeping under bridges, people who are in a terrible plight of life, they are overlooked. They are driven by, we don't pay attention, we don't have peripheral vision for that sort of stuff. But pure religion, true religion doesn't overlook because God doesn't do it. It's through the life of a widow and the life of widows that God reveals his heart to us. It's through the life of a widow that God reminds us that He's got us. Regardless, He's got us. It's through the life of a widow that God demonstrates His grace to us. God doesn't overlook the overlooked, but through the overlooked, I believe God gives us insight to His heart. He gives us a picture of who He is. He, he shows us His promises, and He clearly spells out His expectations for our lives. Maybe the most famous widow in the Bible is the woman, the widow from Zarephath. And I'm going to, I'm going to read it. It's a long version, but it's worth reading. Arise, this is God speaking to Elijah. Elijah's in a place called Cherith, and he's, he's in there. It's a place that God has provided for him, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And now God says to him, the brook has run dry. Now you need to move, and you need to go to Zarephath, which is, belongs to Sidon. And stay there. Behold, I commanded a widow there to provide for you. And he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called and said, how's that for cheeky? He called this widow. How's that for faith? How's that for obedience? He calls this widow because God had commanded a widow. How did he know which widow? How do you do that? Walk by faith like that. Call this widow and he said, please give me a jar, a water in a jar that I might drink. And as she was going to get it, she called, he called her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. 
Now, I know some bold people in this room. One of them is Winston Shaman. And I know that this guy was not Dutch like Winston. Winston does that. Hey, how's the sandwich? Not afraid. You know what I mean? And I like that. But that's Dutch. That's not faith. And so he's doing this on the blind. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in a bowl and oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I might go in and prepare for myself and my son that we might eat it and die. So negative. Isn't she? Didn't have faith. Isn't it interesting that Elijah says, give me some bread? And she said, I don't have, I only have flour and oil. And he was saying, no, give me bread. Actually, what you do have is bread. Then Elijah said, do not fear. Listen to this. Do not fear. Underline this. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said and make a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterwards you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord your God, the God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, shall not run out. The jar of oil will not be empty until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and she did according to the word of Elijah, which is the word of the Lord. And she came and he and her household ate for many days. She had enough flour for one meal and then da. And then he said, hey, let's make me a bit of a bread cake, bring it to me and then eat. And, and, they, and it says now, they ate for many days. And the bowl and the flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah spoke. And it gets worse for her. And now it came about after these things that the son of the woman uh, was on a mattress. He became very sick and his sickness was so severe that he had no breath left in him. So she said, he said to Elijah, What have I done with, to, with what have I to do with you, O man of God? You have come to bring me to bring my iniquities to remembrance and put my son to death. What, what's going on here? I'm feeding you, and my son's died. And he said to her, Give me your son. And then he took him to, from her bosom and carried him up to his upper room where he was living and laid him on his bed. And he called out to the Lord, O Lord my God. You have also brought calamity to this woman um, with whom I'm staying by causing her, to die, him, her son to die. And then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord, O oh Lord, I pray, let this child's life return to him. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. How's that? Resurrection power. Hey? I love this. See, your son is alive. And then the woman came to Elijah. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of God, the word of the Lord is in, the mouth, in your mouth. That word is true. Zarephath means refinery. That's what that word means. You're a widow. You're in a desolate place. You're despairing. You're depressed. You're desperate. You're disillusioned. You're feeling like you want the earth to open up and swallow you. Sadness is covering you like a big, heavy, wet, damp blanket. Emptiness aches within you, and you're at the end. You're broke, and you're, bro and you're broken, and you're at Zarephath, the refinery. You're in the fire. You're, you're going through the fire. That's a double whammer. That's what I would call a double whammer. And God has a plan. Peter says this, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus. Even in the fire, God will test and shape you in the fire. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you have not, did not see him now, you believe in him and greatly rejoice with a joy inexplainable, inexpressible. The true story is this. We will, at some stage, all end up at Zarephath. Whether you're a widow or a prophet, we will all end up at God's refinery. Zarephath, the place that God refines his people. 
we'll all end up there. And some of us might be there right now. You might be that widow. You might be that play person in despair, disillusioned, depressed, wanting the world to swallow you up. You're broke or you're broken. You might be in that place and you find yourself living there in Zarephath, like the widow living at Zarephath. But you know, Zarephath, if, you have, if you're not living there, you most probably will be, end up moving there like the prophet Elijah, who was hiding in a little place that God had carved out for him during the, 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 the drought that the nation was experiencing in a place called Cherith, the brook of Cherith, a place where God supernaturally provided for him by ravens. How the world around him is starving. He's got this water fresh running and the birds are bringing him food provisions. And then that all dries up. And then God says, I've got you, Elijah. I've got you. Maybe there's someone here that feels like life's dried up. It's not working out the way it used to work out. I used to have ravens providing for me. I used to have a spring, a nice fresh river of provision for my life. And now that's all dried up. And you need to hear the Lord saying, maybe he's saying to you, go to Zarephath. And you're going, oh, Lord, must I go to the refinery? Zarephath was the place the widow lived. And Zarephath is the place the prophet moved to. And the truth is this. Zarephath is not an easy place to be in. To be in the fire, to be in the refinery, is not an easy place to be in. But Zarephath is where we are refined. It's where we are purified. It's where we are filtered. It's where we are decontaminated. It's where we are unpolluted. It's where we are straightened out. And if we're honest enough with ourselves, we will admit that we as Jesus followers are in process. We're on a journey. We've been made complete. And a lot of that happens in Zarephath. We want it all to be nice and easy and hunky-dory. We want to live forever at the brook of Cherith where there's always lovely fresh water and where God just supernaturally provides ravens for everything we need. But it doesn't. Always, life is not always like that. You know that and I know that. Most of us will end up at Zarephath. And so again, we hear these words from, from Peter chapter one, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. It says, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that He might exalt you at the proper time, cast all your anxieties upon Him, because He cares for you. Be sober of spirit and be on the alert. And let me just say this. You're going to be on the alert. Don't just be on the alert, and it does say for the devil, but be on the alert for the voice of the Lord because he is speaking. There are times when we, when we're seeing the life in front of us run out and we become so panicky, we become so anxious, we become so overwhelmed, our ears close. And then we start blaming the devil and the pastor and the, the rugby team and everything else. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to move you to Zarephath. Be sober in spirit and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Let me tell you this. You can stay at the brook of Cherith and die just because of stubbornness just because of disobedience, just because of spiritual arrogance, you know better. Or we can listen to the Lord and we can go into the fire and He can complete us. And the devil will kill us at the brook of Cherith. That's what he'll do. If we're not moving with the Lord, if we're not living in the Spirit, if we're not being led by the Spirit, it is Pentecost uh, Sunday. Praise Jesus for that. But Pentecost Sunday is every day of our lives, friends. Don't become all holy, spiritual on a Sunday. We live in and walk in the Spirit and led by the Spirit every single day as a Jesus follower. And He is speaking every single day because the Lord wants us to live in the, His fullness on this journey. But resist Him. Resist the devil. Firm in your faith, knowing that... That the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are all in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, says Peter, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, comfort, strengthen, and establish you. And friends, that doesn't happen outside of Zarephath. 
You see, I believe this is where God speaks to us, and this is where we need to learn to listen in Zarephath, in the finery, in the fire, in the struggle. Just because we're in Zarephath doesn't mean we can get out of life. Oh, woe is me. My world has fallen apart. I'm in the fire. It's too hot. It's too troublesome. I don't know what to do. And we stop doing things. We don't get out of life and living because we're in Zarephath. We're not paralyzed by the refiner's fire. We are refined in the refiner's, refiner, the refiner's fire. Regardless of how challenging it is, God uses us even in Zarephath. God causes His kingdom to advance regardless of where we're at. He used Elijah as a prophet to the woman in Zarephath. He used the woman as a provider to Elijah in Zarephath. God reveals Himself to us in Zarephath. Because he says, go to Zarephath, you, you're going to go into the refinery, into the refiner's fire. We must understand the re Zarephath, the refinery, the refiner's fire is more about the refiner than the fire. You got that? Zarephath is more about God than Zarephath. And we get so overwhelmed by Zarephath that we forget the God of Zarephath, the God of Elijah. At Zarephath, God reveals His heart. He reveals His heart, I believe, through the most fragile, through the most vulnerable among us, people in those desolate places in despair and, and broken. I believe God in those places reveals His heart to us. I believe it's, it's in Zarephath that God reveals that He is a strong defender and protector of the widow. In Zarephath. Exodus 22 says this, You shall not afflict any widow or orphan. God making a command. Don't mess with my children. Don't mess with those in a desolate place. Don't mess with the orphans. Don't mess with the widows. Don't mess with those who are depressed and depraved. Don't mess with those. I will protect them. If you afflict them, and if they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my anger will be kindled, and he says this, and I will kill you with a sword. Now, I don't, we don't like hearing that because we're the New Testament people, but God protects widows. He defends the defenseless. He never overlooks the overlooked. And he gets mad when we overlook them. God says, I am a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widow. I am the God in His holy habitation. Don't mess with me and don't mess with my kids. He's revealing His heart. Nothing about God has changed from the beginning of time to right now. Not only does He do that, He provides for the fatherless and the widow. For the Lord your God, in Deuteronomy 10, for the Lord your God is the God of the gods and the Lord of the lords, the great and the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality or take a bribe. When God looks at the rich and He looks at the poor, He sees a child. He doesn't see anything else. He executes justice on the orphan and the widow, and He shows His love for the refugee by giving them food and clothing. In Psalm 40, 146, it says this, verse 8, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord rises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the stranger. He supports the fatherless and the widow. And He will thwart the ways of the wicked. He's revealing His heart. God is revealing His heart in those who are downtrodden, the least, the furthest, the overlooked. Not only that, He is the promise keeper. He wants the widows to be cared for and visited and provided for and protected. He is a promise keeper. So this is how He keeps His promise. He keeps His promise through you and me. 
He wants us. He expects us. You see, God reveals His expectations to us through the widows. He expects you and I to care for the widows the way He would care for the widows if He was here in skin. In fact, He is here in skin through His church. Isaiah 1.17 Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. I want you to do that, church. That's what God's saying. My, my, my widows, my widows will be looked after by my church. Honor widows who are widows indeed. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. Cherish them. Esteem them. Treasure them. Love them. Visit them. Care for them. Honor them. You've got to do it. That's what he's saying. You've got to do it. I'm leaving it to you. Don't mess up. Don't mess up. Are you okay? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a reality that when God speaks about these things, it's like He, he tugs at our hearts. When we walked out last night on Friday night with those 40 kids, I just, you just see that tug in your heart. We came back afterwards. You know what they said? We said, so what do you feel? Somebody said, I wish we could have prayed longer. I wish we could have reached out to more people. So here's the last thought I want to do, and you have to put on your thinking caps because we're going to go for it with regards to what I want to say this morning, as God reveals Himself through the, through the overlooked, through the story of Zarephath, not only do we need to hear all the above, we also need to hear this, God never runs out. This reminds me of the woman that Jesus met at the offering box at church. And Jesus looked upon her and saw the, looked upon the crowd and saw all the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. He never judged them, He just looked at them. And he saw a poor widow putting two small coins into the, into the box. Like, um, like Katie. Cling, cling. And, um, and he said, Truly I say to you, this widow put in more than all of them, for they all out of their surplus put into the offering. But she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. She gave the gift of everything. Because she had put her trust in God completely. She knew the woman of Zarephath. She had lived in her home. She, had, she knew her struggles. She had her anxiety. She experienced her despair. She thought the unthinkable, this is my last day. She also knew the God of Elijah. She had put her trust in the God who never runs out. She knew that, that uh, when we're at our end and when we have no one and when we have nothing, there is one thing that remains and that's the promise of God's Word. Like the, like the woman at Zarephath said, Now I know that you are a, God of, a man of God, that the Word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. You see, it doesn't matter what's in your hand. What matters is what's in your heart. Trust in the Lord, the prophets say, with all your heart and all your understanding. What matters is that there, there is trust in the Lord in your heart. That's what matters, that you trust in the Lord. When we are running out, trust has faith that God will walk in. When we are giving up, trust has faith that God will fill us up. When we have nothing to eat, trust has faith that God has something to say. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour will never be exhausted. The oil flask will never run out until the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth because He is the God who never runs out. So give of your first. Give of your everything. Faith in His Word. Put it in His Word because He is the God who keeps His promises to us. You know, it might have been said at Zarephath, what happens in Zarephath stays at Zarephath and dies in Zarephath. Not anymore because God spoke. Never again because God has spoken. The widow of Zarephath, she said she had run out and yet God sent Elijah to walk in. And so, and said to her, make me some bread. 
I think we get to the end of things because we don't trust God with the first things. We get to the end of things because we don't trust God with the first thing. I think we run out because we don't listen to what God says. I think that's why we run out. There is no reason on earth, regardless of what economic world, economic situation we find ourselves in, regardless of the famine or the pandemic, there is no reason, doesn't make sense to me, that we as followers of God should run out. You try and work it out because He has spoken. Either we believe that what He has said is true or we don't. And if He is the God who says, you will never run out, then we should do everything we can to express our trust in the Lord. If we give God the first of who we are and what we have, if we give God the first of who we are and what we have, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be given to you. What things? All the things the Father cares for in our lives. That's what He wants. It's that first place. If we give of the first of who we are, our hearts, our treasure, our hearts, and everything we have, we will never run out because God will make sure the flower bowl is never exhausted and the oil flask never runs out. I believe that. The widow at Zarephath, the widow who gave her two pennies, they gave the gift of everything because they simply believed what God said. And God says it again and again and again and again. Give and it will be given to you. And they will pour into your lap good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. For by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you. What you give out will be given back to you. How you measure it out will be measured back to you. The grace of God is an eternal spring of life and has no end. The grace of God will never run out. So we should give away the grace of God however often we can. The forgiveness of God will never run out. So forgive and forgive and forgive. 490 times forgive because the forgiveness of God never runs out. And the love of God never runs out. So love recklessly. Who cares if people don't like us? It doesn't matter if they like us. We're going to love them. The promises of God never run out. So take hold of every promise in God's Word. Don't just hold on to one and give up because you never saw it. Take hold of every single promise God has for you. Be bold and believe in it. He never runs out on us, so therefore we should be living fully for Him. We need to learn from the widow who gave her last pennies. We need to learn from the widow of Zarephath. Trust in Him and His Word. It doesn't matter how much you have. Give, it, give Him the first of what you have anyway. It doesn't matter how little you have. Give Him the first bread cake. Give it to Him. It doesn't matter what's in your hand. It matters what's in your heart. Elijah asked for a little bread. Bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And she said, I only got a handful of flour and oil left, and then I'm going to die. Don't let what we have and don't let what we don't have to be another excuse. When God is present, He changes the atmosphere. He changes things. We are so full of excuses because we are terrified to believe in the promises of God. But there will come a point in your life and in my life where we will draw a line in the sand like Elijah. I will leave the brook of Cherith and I will go to Zarephath and I will live in him and I will trust him. And you'll be like the widow in Zarephath and you'll think you're at the end and then the word of the Lord will come and speak to you and you'll say, and it'll never run out. At some point, Jesus' followers have to draw a line in the sand and believe His Word. All of it. Every single part of it. Every written letter. Every promise that He has given us. 
And she said, I don't have anything left. And she made an excuse. You see, what we have in our hands is enough for God to multiply. It doesn't matter if you have one cup of flour and a little drop. It doesn't matter because God takes it and he puts it together. And he puts it together. And he puts it together. And it just keeps multiplying. And you keep eating. And you keep living. Oh, but I can't forgive that person. I know you can't if you don't want to, but if you trust the Lord and believe that He has enough forgiveness, then you'll forgive and you'll forgive and you'll forgive until you forget because you remember the love of God. Stop making excuses. Zarephath is a great place to be and it's a horrible place to be, but it's where God reveals Himself to us. So the Lord would say to us, bring me first a bread cake and then eat what you want to eat. And if you do, then the promises of God, the promises of God start multiplying out. It rolls out. The promises of God are mobilized in our lives. That's what happened. Simple obedience releases the unimaginable promises of God. Simple obedience. It doesn't matter if you're a conservative evangelical. It doesn't matter if you're a kingdom now, then, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It doesn't matter if you're Word of Faith or Pentecostal, or Presbyterian, or Baptist. It doesn't matter who you are. This is who you are, a child of God. And if you are a child of God, you will end up in Zarephath. And in Zarephath, God will complete His work in you. But you've got to believe in the God of Elijah. You've got to believe in the living God because it is that God that never runs out. And thus the Lord said to Israel, the God, thus the Lord said, the God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. And so she went and did according to the word of the Lord. And she and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was never exhausted. And nor did the oil become empty according to the word of the Lord. God doesn't overlook the overlooked. And He uses the most vulnerable broken, desolate people to reveal himself to us. To, to show us what he expects of us. To declare to us, you need to know, I never run out. Just when you found that last trillion galaxy, there is more. <laughs> it's exciting, eh? So why don't we pray, Lord, I'm giving this, me. Here I am. I'm the first bread cake. Consume me, Lord. Fill me, Lord. Multiply me, Lord, so that you are glorified. And everything I have, and everything I wish I had, and it doesn't matter how much I have, it is yours. It is yours. So that you can be glorified by us on the earth. So that we can look after the people that you want us to look after while we have breath. Until you send the rain. And we pray this in the wonderful, powerful, almighty, majestic, all ruling name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So watch out. We're on our way to Zarephath. But it's a good place to be. But it's a hard place to be. Have an excellent week. May God bless you.